This is a video that I was hoping I would never have to make, but it seems like that time has come. Growing up a New Jersey Nets fan since the mid-2000s, I saw my fair share of good basketball and horrendous basketball at times. Even a Nets team that finished 12-70 in 2009. The Nets moved to Brooklyn for the 2012-2013 season, hoping to obviously bring in more revenue, but also bring in more star talent. They attempted to acquire the likes of Carmelo Anthony and Dwight Howard in 2011, but those plans never came to fruition. They moved to Brooklyn with Darren Williams as their star, but got so desperate to compete for a title that they made what is the worst trade in NBA history. They acquired 36-year-old Paul Pierce, 37-year-old Kevin Garnett, and 36-year-old Jason Terry in exchange for salary dumps and three first round picks plus one pick swap. We all know how that went down, and just a couple of years later, the Nets were one of the worst teams in the league. And to make matters worse, they saw their Eastern Conference foe, the Boston Celtics, draft the likes of Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown with a pick that previously belonged to Brooklyn. Things completely hit rock bottom. But then the Nets made a GM hire, bringing in Sean Marks from the Spurs organization, and everything turned around. In the summer of 2019, I made a video titled How Sean Marks Saved the Brooklyn Nets, and there was no denying that he worked miracles at that time. The Nets coming off three seasons in a row of under 30 wins with no draft assets shockingly made the playoffs in the 2018-2019 season with a 42-40 and record. And the main players on that team were all Sean Marks guys, whether it was D'Angelo Russell, whom they recently acquired, players he drafted like Karis LeVert and Jared Allen, and even guys the league hadn't given up on like Spencer Dinwiddie and Joe Harris. After losing in five to the Sixers in the playoffs, the Nets were in a prime position to make a big splash. And I mean big. They had cap space for two max contracts, and on June 30th, 2019 at 4.56 p.m., one of the biggest Woj bombs ever took place, as it was announced that Brooklyn had signed Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving, and DeAndre Jordan. It was complete jubilation for Nets fans. Now, of course, Kevin Durant had just tore his Achilles, so he was not going to be involved for the 2019-2020 season. That season overall was kind of a waiting year, knowing that Durant would be out, and to make matters worse, Kyrie Irving only played in 20 games that year, battling a shoulder injury. Kenny Atkinson, their head coach, who had done a good job developing their young talent was fired in early March of 2020. Of course, right after COVID hit and everything got messed up, but the Nets were 30 and 34 at that time and were eligible for the Orlando bubble. The problem was that most of the Nets' best players did not even make the trip. Kyrie and KD were still absent due to injury, and guys like Spencer Dinwiddie, DeAndre Jordan, Torian Prince, and even Wilson Chandler did not make the trip to Orlando. Safe to say that the Nets' trip to the bubble was a wash, but at least Karis LeVert blossomed into a household name at that time. They were eventually swept by a healthy Raptors team in the playoffs, but now was the fun part. For the 2020-21 season, the year started late because of COVID, and the shortened season began on December 22nd instead of October like usual. Anyway, the Nets made some improvements like adding Landry Shamit, Jeff Green, and trading for Bruce Brown. In the first two games of the 7-11 era, which is Katie and Kyrie, the Nets started a 2-0 and had two dominant wins over the Warriors and Celtics. It all seemed too good to be true, and I was right. Spencer Dinwiddie tore his ACL in his third game of the season, and soon after, just eight games into the season, Kyrie Irving just vanished. Nobody knew why he left the Nets, but he was gone for seven games. Rumors were that he needed a break due to the January 6th event at the White House or had family matters to attend to, but I'm not really sure to be honest. But during that time is where our story really begins. Whether it was due to the uncertainty with Irving or maybe this was in the cards all along, the Nets made one of the biggest trades in their history. On January 14th, 2021, just 13 games into the KD Kyrie experiment, the Nets traded for Rocket superstar James Harden. And just like that, the next big three in the NBA was born. The Nets did have to move Jared Allen and Karis LeVert and Torian Prince and a bunch of draft picks, but the Nets were all in to win a championship with this group. Questions arose whether Harden's ball-dominant play style could mesh with Durant and Kyrie, but those concerns were put to rest pretty quickly. In his first game in Brooklyn, Harden put up a stat line of 32 points, 14 assists, and 12 rebounds in a win 
win over Orlando. The first game including the Big 3 on January 20th was spoiled in Cleveland as the Cavs won 147-135 to in double overtime. Unfortunately for the Nets, their Big 3 only lasted 3 games together until the injury bug bit them, which would turn into a common theme sadly. First it was KD who missed 7 weeks with a hamstring injury, but during that time James Harden played at an MVP level, winning player of the month in February and March and getting the Nets into first place. But eventually, it was James Harden who suffered a hamstring pull of his own on March 31st and was never back until the last couple games of the season. Overall, the Nets had a great regular season going 48-24 and which was second in the Eastern Conference. Despite their three superstars hardly playing together, the 2021 Nets had the best offensive rating in NBA history for an entire season at 118.3. The experiment was working perfectly, but health and availability was the only question. Their big three finally got healthy in time for the playoffs and a first round matchup with the 7 seed Boston Celtics was up first. The Nets won in 5 and put up some of the most dominant offensive numbers you'll ever see in a playoff series with a 130.1 offensive rating. But this sadly was the peak of Brooklyn's big three when it felt like it could be just the beginning. At this time, the Nets were overwhelming favorites to win the NBA Finals and barring injuries, it looked like Brooklyn would secure its first title in franchise history. In round two, just 43 seconds into game one, James Harden came up limping and his hamstring gave out again for the third time that season. Harden went to the locker room and didn't return. The Nets, however, just kept winning. In game one, they beat the Bucks by eight, and in game two, they destroyed them by 39 points. It looked like even without Harden, they would still be fine. But in game four, after a tough defensive battle and a game three loss, is when the series changed. Right before halftime, Kyrie Irving went for a layup and severely sprained his ankle on Giannis Antetokounmpo's foot, and the momentum completely shifted. Whether Giannis did this on purpose, which he has been accused of, and even Kyrie questioned that himself, this turned ankle could have been the difference between the finals and a second round exit. The series was now tied at two. In game five, Harden, who was maybe 50% at best, decides to play through the injury. Kevin Durant scored 49 that night, beating the Bucks to go up 3-2 in the series. After dropping game six on the road, the Nets season came down to game seven at home. With with Durant in God mode, Harden on one leg, and Kyrie not available, the Nets gave it their best shot. Durant scored 48 on 47% shooting and made an incredible game-tying shot that was literally inches away from sending the Nets to the conference finals. But Durant's toe was on the line and the Nets went to overtime and simply just ran out of gas. KD and Harden played all 53 minutes in the overtime battle in a loss that still haunts me till this day as a Nets fan. Now would they have gone on to win the finals with Harden playing on a grade two hamstring strain and Kyrie not playing at all? It's a lot to ask for, but with KD being locked in at that point, I would not say it's impossible. It was a crushing end to the season, but the Nets knew that as long as they were healthy, they'd have the talent to win it all the next few years. I've talked to different guys throughout the, the offseason, and after the finals was over, I remember texting KD and just being like, that should have been us. You know, he texted back and said, in, in due time. In due time, brother. That's what he said, and uh, that's the best way to look at it. You know what I mean? We just gotta put the work in, and, and it's the beauty of the NBA. You always get another season to, to come back and try it. But little did we know that would be the one and only time the big three had a chance to make a championship run. What would go on to happen from the summer of 2021 up until present day was a mixture of some of the worst luck and incompetence that you'll ever see from a sports franchise. The good news was that KD signed an extension to stay in Brooklyn, but Harden wanted to wait it out and Kyrie's offer was rescinded due to an issue that may have been the downfall of this entire experiment. Nets GM Sean Marks proclaimed that extensions for the Big Three would be signed, sealed, and delivered by the start of training camp, and welp, he was wrong. Harden wanted to wait it out, and Kyrie was offered the max extension as well until he was demanded to get vaccinated first, and Kyrie, of course, did not want to. Now, the rule in New York City at that time was you needed to be vaccinated to attend public events, and Kyrie Irving was obviously not vaccinated. The Nets and Kyrie were hoping 
for an exemption, but it never happened. Therefore, the Nets decided to send Kyrie home rather than making him a part-time player that only played in road games. It was a crucial decision that I believe they messed up and could have costed them losing James Harden in the coming months. GM Sean Marks also had a brutal offseason losing guys like Jeff Green and Landry Shamit to replace them with DeAndre Bembry and James Johnson. Anyway, the Nets got off to a great start and at one point they were 23-9 and right around Christmas and first place in the Eastern Conference. The Nets also announced around that time that they would allow Kyrie Irving to play part-time but not in home games obviously. Maybe it was a change of heart, the Joe Harris injury, or the over-reliance on KD and Harden but regardless the Nets gave Kyrie permission to return. As for Harden, he wasn't exactly himself for most of the season. With the short offseason he never fully recovered from the hamstring strain it felt like and he was putting up career lows in a lot of areas. When Kyrie returned to the lineup, the big three played in their final two games together, both on the road of course. First was a 129-119 win at Indiana in Kyrie's season debut in early January, and the last game they all played together was a 138-112 win at Chicago against a Bulls team that was battling for first place. This Nets team with Harden, Irving, and Durant on the floor seemed impossible to stop, but luckily for the rest of the league, it would be the last time they'd ever play together. What happened two games later may have been the straw that broke the camel's back, and by that I mean James Harden had become fed up with his time in Brooklyn and had his sights on Philadelphia. On Saturday, January 15th, Kevin Durant suffered a friendly fire MCL sprain that would end up keeping him out around two months. And while the Nets were still in a great spot standings-wise at 27 and 15, it felt like from this point on that everything changed. The Nets won their first two out of three without KD, were first seed in the East, and then the bottom completely fell out on this team. And to make it worse, rumors started to circulate that James Harden was not a fan of living in Brooklyn and would test out free agency during the summer. The Nets went from 29 and 16 on January 23rd to 29 and 27 by February 12th. 11 losses in a row for a team that was considered the betting favorites to win the finals. And during that time is when James Harden completely quit on the team. He missed games with hand and hamstring issues, whether that was true or not, and then blatantly tanked a game at Sacramento where he scored four points on two of 11 shooting and had six turnovers. That would end up being Harden's last game as a Brooklyn Net. And an hour before the trade deadline, the big three was officially over as Harden went to the Sixers for Ben Simmons, Seth Curry, and expiring Andre Drummond and two first round picks. Harden during his introduction to Philly mentioned that he wanted to be a Sixer the whole time, which just made the entire situation even worse. Without KD, a disengaged Harden, and a part-time Kyrie, the Nets fell apart. Over an 18-game stretch, they went 3-15 and and from first place all the way to the 8th seed, which was the play-in tournament. Once KD returned and the vaccine mandate was lifted, the Nets got back to winning with 7-11 on the floor and closed out the season 12-5 to secure the 7th seed and face the Cavs in the play-in. The big piece they received in the Harden trade, however, had yet to see the floor. Ben Simmons had not suited up two months after the trade and wouldn't for the remainder of the season, battling a back issue that would require off-season surgery. Now, why did the Nets trade for damaged goods and pass Simmons and even Seth Curry on their physicals? I'm not entirely sure, but it just proves how incompetent the front office had become. Anyway, Brooklyn won the playing game and for the second year in a row faced the Boston Celtics in round one. This time, however, it was Boston as the two seed and Brooklyn as the seven seed. The Celtics had everything the Nets lacked, good coaching, size, length, and continuity. Although the Nets kept every game close in that series and should have won game one and game two and maybe even game four, the series resulted in a Boston sweep. Kevin Durant played some of the worst basketball in his life and Kyrie was a no-show after an amazing game one performance. Brooklyn entered a crucial offseason. Kyrie Irving had a player option so he could have technically left Brooklyn that summer but he got little to no offers from other teams around the league, so he picked up his one-year deal and returned. Just two days later, though, breaking news, Kevin Durant has requested a trade from the Brooklyn Nets, completely shocked the NBA community, and stuff just got real. It was rumored that Durant had not spoke to upper management for months at that point and later revealed his issues with the organization, mainly stating the lack of accountability within the organization and their 3-15 stretch without him last season was not up to par, and 
and how could you blame him for that? He also thought he was signing up to play with Kyrie and James Harden long term, who were promised to sign their extensions, but they never did. The problem was that KD had no leverage, considering he was only entering year one of a four-year deal with the Brooklyn Nets. It was going to take a godfather offer from another team to pry KD away, and the Nets never got that offer. Brooklyn tried to upgrade their roster in the midst of the KD saga by trading for Royce O'Neal, taking a shot on TJ Warren, and extending Nicholas Claxton. They made some questionable decisions like retaining Patty Mills over Bruce Brown, which I don't know why they did that. Throughout the rest of the offseason, Kevin Durant gave the Nets an ultimatum and demanded Steve Nash and GM Sean Marks were fired, but once again, KD did not have the leverage, and the Nets figured he would not sit out. A few weeks later, KD's camp and the Brooklyn Nets came to an agreement to move forward in their partnership so he'd remain a Brooklyn Net for now. It was rumored that Clara Wu Sai, the wife of Nets owner Joe Sai, was a major factor in getting Durant back on board to play in Brooklyn. So the Nets proceeded into 2022-2023 season with a new look. Ben Simmons was now their third star and no one knew what he was going to look like. And spoiler alert, he looks pretty damn awful up until this point, aside from like 10 games. Irving sees a seam, drops it off, Simmons dishes, Durant from 15, cap. A lot of the Nets' hopes this year for competing for a championship lied on the shoulders of Ben Simmons and what type of impact he would make on both ends, and clearly it has not been enough. Brooklyn started 2-5 and five, and Steve Nash was fired after just over two seasons. Nash's inept coaching could have definitely played a role in this as well, there's no doubt. Reports were that one of the driving factors in James Harden's departure that previous season was that he had disagreements with Steve Nash on how to run the Nets' offense. And as I said, with Mike D'Antoni leaving the the Nets that offseason, it's definitely possible. And if the Nets actually had a good head coach during the Big Three era, you never know what could have gone differently. Does Harden still ask out? Do the Nets escape the Bucks series with better coaching? Do players seem more bought in? We will never get those answers, but it's definitely possible. Ultimately, the Steve Nash hire was a failure, and although Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving get blamed for that hire, they shouldn't. It's been reported that neither Irving or Durant had Steve Nash as their number one choice. It's been reported that KD wanted to Lou and Kyrie wanted Phil Handy as their head coaches. And obviously, neither got their wish. But man, Ty Lou would have been awesome. When Nash was a rookie head coach two seasons prior, he had a perfect supporting cast. His assistant coaches on that staff were Ime Udoka, Mike D'Antoni, Jock Vaughn, and even Steve Clifford. All Nash had to do was show up and clap his hands, which at times felt like his only contribution anyway. Speaking of Ime Udoka, the Nets tried to rehire him while being suspended by the Celtics, but whether it was the league preventing it or something else, the idea fell through and the Nets promoted their assistant coach Jock Vaughn as the full-time head coach. Not only was this a difficult job given the 2-5 and five star and odd personalities to handle, but right after Vaughn was promoted, Kyrie Irving was suspended by the team for promoting a film that had anti-Semitic beliefs. Irving would miss 8 games total, but under Jock Vaughn, the Nets had a new identity. They were sharing the ball like never before and playing defense at a very high level, which is something you've never seen from this group before. Once Irving returned from injury, combined with Jock Vaughn's upgrade and coaching over Steve Nash, the Nets went 20-4 and over their next 24 games and were one game back of first place in the Eastern Conference. They had an 18-2 and stretch throughout December, which was the best 20-game stretch in Brooklyn slash New Jersey Nets franchise history. It looked like things were actually going to turn around, and the Nets were being recognized as a potential finals contender. But then, deja vu all over again. Almost exactly a year later, Kevin Durant sustained another MCL injury, and while this one was not as bad as the one last year, it's still expected to keep him out for four to six weeks. The PTSD for Nets fans kicked in, remembering that the team collapsed last year going 3-15 without him, including an 11-game losing streak just a year prior. But the Nets players that were on the team last year proclaimed this was not the same thing as last year. And right at the forefront of that was Kyrie Irving, stating that everyone this year was committed unlike last year, possibly throwing shade at James Harden. The Nets would lose their first four games without KD, and once again, it looked like they would not be able to weather the storm without him. Fortunately, they'd win their next four out of six games and stayed afloat before a 39-point blowout defeat against the Boston Celtics. Two days later, and literally out of nowhere, Shams tweeted that Kyrie Irving has requested a trade from the Brooklyn Nets. That would mean that three superstars within one calendar year have asked out of 
Brooklyn. But this Kyrie Irving request was shocking. After being on record saying, I can't leave my man seven, meaning he did not want to leave Kevin Durant, and even recently stating that everyone was all in with this team just a few weeks back, none of it seemed to make sense. It was released that the Nets offered Irving a contract including many stipulations and Kyrie felt he deserved a fully guaranteed max deal. Kyrie was already not in good graces with the Nets ownership and rather than trying to figure out a way around this, they shipped him to the Dallas Mavericks in return for Spencer Dinwiddie, Dorian Finney-Smith, and a few draft picks. The hometown kid who grew up a Nets fan was now gone and it all happened in a blink of an eye. He definitely wanted to stay a Brooklyn Net, but owner Joe Tsai was never really a big Kyrie fan. At least with James Harden a year prior, you could tell that based on his body language and leaked reports that he did not want to be in Brooklyn much longer. But for Kyrie, it was just so random and out of the blue. Kyrie admitted that he felt disrespected and only tolerated by the Nets front office and not feeling wanted. The attention since then has immediately gone to Kevin Durant and what his future holds with the Brooklyn Nets. Once again, with KD under contract for three more seasons, it's tough for him to just demand the trade and expect the Nets to grant him that wish. There there was speculation of the Nets trying to find another co-star for KD and Pascal Siakam was the main trade target at first. But after things were quiet, and I mean too quiet, on Thursday morning or Wednesday night, depending on where you live, another huge Woj bomb broke the internet. Kevin Durant was traded from the Brooklyn Nets to the Phoenix Suns for Mikael Bridges, Cam Johnson, Jay Crowder, four first round picks, and a 2028 pick swap. It was officially over. The era that began on June 30th, 2019 was over the morning of February 9th, 2023. KD was heavily linked to the Suns over the summer and Phoenix was his preferred destination all along. According to Brian and Windhorse yesterday, KD did say he would remain with the Nets the rest of the year if they could not find a way to get him to Phoenix, but they did. At least this time for the Nets as compared to post Kevin Garnett and Paul Pierce eight years ago, the Nets gave themselves enough assets to possibly get out of this hole sooner than expected. They have 11 first round picks from now until 2029 and have solid assets under 30 years old. Whether Sean Marks finally gets fired or gets the attempt of his second rebuild of the Nets is yet to be seen. And I'll say it now because it seems way too easy to predict, next offseason the Suns will move off Chris Paul, sign Kyrie Irving in free agency, and the Suns will have KD and Kyrie along with Booker and Aiton. It'll be the next super team in the NBA. So where did it all go wrong for the Nets in their big three era? Well, you clearly can't blame just one person, although some people want to make it just about Kyrie. Let's start with GM Sean Marks and owner Joe Tsai. Number one, Marks made too many mistakes after acquiring James Harden. He did a great job getting the stars there, but fell apart as a GM after they got there. It was rumored that the Nets passed on Kyle Kuzma when Spencer Dinwiddie went to Washington, and maybe that was because the owner didn't want to take on the luxury tax, but that is a massive mistake. The hiring of Steve Nash, which ultimately came down to Sean Marks and Joe Tsai. Marks completely whiffing in the 2022 offseason after losing to Milwaukee in seven and just making the team flat out worse. Sending Kyrie home rather than making him eligible for road games and giving the big three more opportunities to play together. Not getting the mayor of New York City, Eric Adams, to make an exemption for Kyrie Irving's vaccination mandate. It's frustrating because the only reason the mandate was eventually lifted was because the Yankees and Mets applied pressure with a baseball season coming up soon. You're telling me that an owner worth $8.5 billion could not bribe a mayor to make an exemption for his player? I mean, come on. Taking the contract contract of Ben Simmons and not demanding a guy like Tyrese Maxey? And if the Sixers decline, you could have just played out the rest of the year with Harden, Durant, and Irving, and maybe they all played together and actually liked it. Just this season, you were a couple of small moves away from possibly making a very deep playoff run. You were 18-2 over a 20-game stretch, and in December, you had KD and Kyrie still bought in. Instead, they play hardball with Kyrie Irving's contract, pissed him off, led to a trade demand, and in the process, it pissed off Kevin Durant, and the hopes of competing in 2023 are now now over. The list could go on and on, but those two are definitely a big reason for this collapse. Now on to Kyrie, who definitely has a reputation of blowing up two franchises now, although the Cavs and Celtics recovered pretty quickly after his departure. Number one, Kyrie refusing to get vaccinated. It's a controversial topic because I do agree he's a grown man and he can make his own decisions with his own body, but it could have lost them James Harden, it soured his relationship with the front office, and was a deciding factor in not signing his extension with the Nets. Number two, Kyrie taking his 
unannounced leave of absence in January 2021, his anti-Semitic story in 2022, most definitely damaged his reputation and relationship with the team. Number three, requesting a trade in the middle of the season while being the four seed and still in championship contention. I don't blame a man for wanting his money, but that's something that should have been handled in the summer. And of course, you can blame James Harden for one, even listing Brooklyn as a trade request, although he had his sights on the Sixers the entire time. And right when things got tough, he bounced. Number two, not taking care of his body, showing up out of shape after Houston and showing up out of shape his first season in Brooklyn. Even Kevin Durant was reportedly frustrated with Harden's lack of conditioning during the first half of last season before Harden left the Nets. Number three, quitting on his team mid-season. He did something you should never do as an athlete, and that's quit on the field or on the court, and in this case, it's on the court. At least for Kyrie, he gave it his all up until the point he requested that trade, but for James Harden, he just quit on the court at Sacramento in February of 2022. Joe Harris. Yes, Joe Harris is getting blamed too. He completely fell apart mentally or whether it was physically, I don't know, but in the 2021 playoff series against Milwaukee, if Harris was even three quarters of the player he was in the regular season, the Nets win that series. He shot 13 of 49 in the final five games of that series just truly awful, especially with Irving down and Harden hobbled, Joe Harris should be given a standing ovation every time he plays in Milwaukee, and I truly mean that. Lastly, and what I would consider the main culprit was just bad luck. I know nobody wants to hear it, but the amount of unfortunate things out of the Nets control that happened during this era is like something out of a movie. First, we can start with even KD tearing his Achilles in his last season on the Warriors. If that never happens, then the Nets can enter 2019-2020 season with a healthy Durant and Irving, and who knows what could have happened. Second, there's the injuries from there on out, and they occurred at some of the worst times. You had separate hamstring injuries for KD and Harden in the first season the Big Three worked together, and that kept them from forming any continuity, not that it really mattered anyway. You had Harden injure his hamstring right away in round two, leaving Durant and Irving alone to take a 2-0 lead in the series. Then three games later, Kyrie sprains his ankle on Giannis Antetokounmpo's foot, and the entire series shifted. The next year, you had Harden, who never looked himself due to the hamstring injury and being out of shape. Of course, there was a once in a century pandemic that caused one of their best players to miss the first three months of the season and because they happened to play in a city where the vaccination rules actually took place. And Brooklyn was one of the few teams in the league that had this vaccination rule actually apply to them. I mean, what are the chances of that? And then of course, there was Kevin Durant's MCL injuries in the past two years, almost exactly one year apart. Both times KD went out, the Nets were rolling, were a top two seed in the East, and right when he goes out, they struggled mightily. Everyone deserves blame, there's no denying that. The ego of ownership, Kyrie's lack of accountability, James Harden expecting a free ride, and Katie's month-long injuries in the middle of the season at the most inopportune times. I treated this on my account a few days ago, and I definitely have no regrets about this era. If you played out this simulation with these three guys at least 100 times, the Nets probably end up winning a title at least 80% of the time. They just ran into the worst possible outlier, and it is what it is. This era will haunt me forever, there's no doubt about that, but it was worth taking a shot because when they had that team playing together, they were close to unbeatable. It may take the Nets another two or three years to get back into title contention, but once once again, they have enough assets to get this dark cloud away from them pretty quickly. Going from watching Donald Sloan and Rondé Hollis Jefferson to Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant always felt surreal, and truthfully, I never took it for granted because I knew how quickly it could end, and it definitely ended pretty quickly. I have mixed feelings about this era, but it will go down as the biggest failure in NBA history and maybe sports history. No matter how miserable it may get, I will always continue to be a Nets fan, and hopefully they can get back to championship aspirations sooner than later. The current Nets are now a weird team. They have plenty of length, plenty of wing guys, and 3 and D guys, and we'll see how they mesh together. If you go down the list, Spencer Dinwiddie, Cameron Johnson, Mikhail Bridges, Dorian Finney-Smith, Nick Claxton, Ben Simmons, Cam Thomas, Royce O'Neal, Seth Curry, Joe Harris, they have decent players on this team and hopefully can put together some type of playoff run. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I put plenty of time into this, so please leave a like if you're still here, and I will talk to you guys next time.